All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Anna from Cycling UK. Thanks for joining us today on this sunny Tuesday or whatever it's like, wherever you guys are. Um, so this is all part of the Women's Festival of Cycling. We're putting on loads of events over a three week course, all digital at the moment, obviously, down to COVID. Uh, so things have changed massively. But the upside of that, I'm sure you've all seen and noticed, is that sales of bicycles, numbers of bums on saddles, people on bikes, um, people not in their cars have massively, massively increased during this time. So we really want to capitalise on that explosion and try and make sure that beginners who are getting into cycling have the information that they need and sort of discuss solutions and possibilities of making sure that cycling really is inclusive for everyone. So the Women's Festival is obviously shining a spotlight on women in cycling. There's a big gender gap uh, within our, our world and our sports. And we at Cycling UK don't think that is necessarily necessary. Um, but within the women's sphere, there's also a whole diversity of different types of people and different situations and different challenges. So that's really what we're going to be discussing in today's conference. And we've got some brilliant panellists who are super experienced in their areas. So what we're going to do is introduce them onto the, um, onto the screen one at a time. We'll have a good chat with each of them. And at the end, we'll try and pull all those ideas together and all of those um, stories and see what sort of potential joint solutions we can come up with as well as different ones. So first up onto the screen, I want to welcome Anila McKenna. Hi, hi Anna. Hi Anila, how are you doing? Are you able to pop your camera on? Yes, of course. That'd be great, so we'd love to see you. <laughs> there we go, can you see me now? Yeah, perfect. Hi, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us today. And I thought I'll leave it to you to give yourself a bit of an introduction and let people know who you are and what your background is, especially, obviously, within the theme of what we're talking about today. Of course. Well, that's my only theme. That's the only one I have <laughs> is inclusiv <laughs> inclusivity in women um, and diversity. So this is very much a, a passionate subject of mine. Yeah, so I'm Anila McKenna and I am a co-partner of Go Wear Scotland, which is a mountain bike tour business. And we provide guiding, coaching. Um, uh, we take people on holidays all over Scotland, seeing all the beautiful wild places that there are. Um, and to ride bikes, to get to know each other. You know, it's, it's an absolutely um, great thing that we do with bringing people together in that way. But in addition to that, um, I do a lot of community work as well, trying to get more women involved in cycling and particularly young girls, getting them out into the, the wild, taking them out to Scottish bothies and uh, being able to be self-sufficient, look after themselves, um, you know, be able to cook their food, light the stove. Some of them sleep out under the stars. It's been absolutely amazing to work with young girls as well. So these are some of the some of the small you know contributions that I make to to trying to get more women into into cycling so my goal wear hat and also running a, a a small women's organization called the FNY collective we do lots of events for women to to get into cycling particularly mountain biking and um yeah and uh, my new organization that we're working with with my friends Chris and Caroline is called Miss Adventures and that's about targeting young girls to into cycling, particularly in the borders. I'm really excited about that. So you're are you based in the borders, but some of your adventures go further afield? Yeah. So some of our like some of our afternoon tea rides, which bring women together, they're they've been run across Scotland. So we 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 go out for a ride. We um we come back in our muddy gear and we sit and have uh, afternoon tea and posh china cups. So. That's been a, 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 something that I've done all over Scotland, which has been fantastic to, to get. I think that's the cake that encourages the women to come out rather than the, <laughs> rather than the cycling. <laughs> <laughs> rather than the outdoors. Well, I guess you're probably trying to work on all sorts of things that will that will be that enticer. I suppose if we're talking about the carrot and the stick, you know, you, you, you're coming up with those carrots there of how to actually encourage people to cycle. And cake's going to be a big one. Um, what other things do you find tick the box for people is really that motivator and especially I think I'd really like to explore more in the young girls age group as well mm -hmm. because that is a massive area 
where girls get out of sport, not just cycling, but as you say, going outdoors, doing adventures and cycling included. So what sort of motivators do you find yeah. work? Well, the most, the biggest thing that I found is having that safe space for women. And, you know, we've, we've worked hard to get there, haven't we? All of us as campaigners and, and trying to get more women into the sport. But having that space where you can meet other women and not feel worried about, you know, your ability and what people are going to say, whether you're going to be judged. And if you can feel that you can go into a space where you feel, oh, this place is for me, it's amazing how people can actually excel from that. And to be able to see other people that ride. And I, I'm a great believer to, to ride with people that are better than you, but also people that you can inspire to. And that's why for many of our rides, we have people of all abilities and to, to, come, to come on our, our, on our rides because they, they learn from each other. They can inspire each other in different ways. And I think so that safe space is really critical because once we have that, that gives people the confidence to go out there and be, go into the mainstream. And I have seen that and I've seen the, the confidence and the change and not just about being with other women, but having the confidence to, to go out there, to be self-sufficient, independent, to be able to know, you know how to get yourself out of your situation if you're up on a hill but being able to do that all in a safe space. So that, that to me, I would say is critical. I think the other thing as well, and it's been interesting when we put, uh, you know, I put up my post about doing this on Twitter, we got quite a lot of feedback from some people. And one of the things that came up was around how cyclists are perceived and the kind of stereotypes, you know, that, that, that we see. And when we think about roadies, who do we think of? We think about you know men in lycra. We think about drop bars. Somebody said somebody puts their feet into these funny things. So you know these are the kind of things that are are, are that kind of environment is not going to be open to everyone because we perceive that that space is only for a, a certain type of rider. But what we're trying to do because of lockdown and all these new people coming in, we need to say that this space is there for everyone. And we need to be able to break down that stereotype to say that, yes, you can ride, but you don't need to wear Lycra. You don't need to have drop bars. You don't need to put your feet in these funny things. You know, you can go out there in your, in your clothes, your, your, your normal clothes and ride bikes. And that, that as well can just be as good as somebody that's out there that's, you know, doing 100 miles. That's you still mountain biking. That's still, still you riding a bike. Yeah, and within cycling, there's so many different groups and tribes as well. You can you can either get into cycling your own way, you know, you do you, you do cycling. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for a group to join or someone to identify with, you're probably likely to find it within the sphere of cycling, aren't you? Like you're talking about lycra and roadies there. You do mountain biking. You have people that will commute. They might be wearing a dress and high heels. Um, people that do long distance bivy bivy bagging, cycling outdoor, uh, well, cycling outdoors, but like. Uh, camping outdoors and things like that so you're generally able to find your tribe if you take those first steps and you're you're pushing the boundaries a lot as you say and you're getting lots of people into it but how did you get into it yourself in the first place well for me i my only my first ever experience of being in a bike was on my brother's chopper and that he gave me a backy on that I remember when I was about 10 years old and I personally didn't have my own bike I wasn't allowed to have my own bike and I've only had to experience mountain biking and cycling through you know as I as I um as I went to university and met my husband and he was a, a keen cyclist and he wouldn't actually he wouldn't go on a date with me unless I went out and rode bikes with him so I was kind of forced into the situation of, of cycling. So was your first date a bike date? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and and he took me took me down some really steep trails in Glasgow in Mugdock Country Park. I'll never forget it. And I was just so happy that I'd survived uh, survived the date. Uh, but you know, 25 years later, I, I've, I obviously have a passion for it now. And um, and I think that's become, I've become, I've, I've learned to love biking for myself because I have, I have been with other women that have inspired me to do that as well. And that I'd say 
you know, going out with your partner. Me and him used to squabble all the time. He'd tell me what to do in my bike, and I'd be like, don't tell me what to do. So he, even, even though he helped, of course he helped, but it was, it was um, you know, I think I needed a different space to be able to develop my skills. So yeah. when I was out biking, it was about 20, you know, it was 20, I'm talking a long time ago, it was 25 years ago when we met. So it was, you know, it's only been in the last six years where I've, I've, I've really, really embraced it. And, you know, and, and it's been great to, to be able to share that with other women around me that help push me and help push my boundaries, as well as I'm able to do that for others too. Yeah, and it obviously all worked out as well. You know, the relationship worked out, the bikes worked <laughs> out. And, and so it was worth taking that first step. And what sort of chat, do you see like common themes running through when it comes to challenges and barriers of getting girls and women into cycling? Is it the same sort of stuff that comes up over and over again? Um, I, th I think there are various barriers uh, for women. I don't think there's, there's one. You know, we also have to accept that women we don't we're not this one homogenous group we have we're made up of multiple identities and you know we can't be categorized as this in this one box and um, so we need to think and recognize that we all have barriers i have barriers about being a person of color and being somebody who's a woman so my challenges might be different to somebody else and um, because i might not see people other women of color within my space so, you know, that questions, is that space for me? Is, well, would I be welcomed? Of course I'm welcomed into that space, but you may have these questions before you before you actually go into that. So that isn't a barrier itself because it might think, well, you know, should I, should, should I be part of that? Because there's not people of color in that space for me. But once you get into it, it's amazing because it is welcoming, it is inclusive. Um, but we have to create those spaces um, to welcome people into that. So of course there are there are barriers. There are barriers, you know, to participation. There's barriers to employment. There's there's barriers in the industry in terms of getting people into um, into the sport. But I think one of the things is I think that we really have to push for is getting more women represented in the leadership roles and to be making decisions about you know how we can have more women's voices represented within the industry because if we can do that i mean we've already seen that when you see women in, in that space it's amazing how creative and 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 how that can help a, a company and organization black brand flourish yeah so wouldn't that be wonderful if we could do that with all diverse groups <laughs> definitely and you've really touched on really what today's panel is about because as you'll see all the guests later on everybody's got massively different experiences massively different challenges um, and massively different solutions as well so it goes you know exactly what you said there women are not just one hom homogenous group that all will find the same solutions that work for them so when you're trying to create your projects you want to get more women into using outdoor spaces preferably on a mountain bike do, <laughs> yes. you, do you bear that in mind are you thinking right i'm going to create a project that's tailored at this specific niche group and sort of tailor it and and um make it get smaller and smaller until you really target um one particular audience or do you just try and open it up and think i'm going to homogenize this and make it a, a mixed space that's open for everybody i think we do i do a bit of both you know because you have to bring new people in don't you uh, or else it'll just be the same people again and again so you have to create that inclusive space for them but the people that are already in the space want to welcome other new people so it's about bringing bringing those people together and um, but you, you i think you do have to be quite focused and, and about who you're targeting i mean if you think about the work that i do with young girls i target young girls around the ages of 9 to 14 because that's the time when they're you know they start to make decisions about well maybe i don't want to be in sport they become a teenager there's other interests you know and they they might disappear from the sport altogether so if you can cap so that's you know combining age with gender if you can capture them at an age you know even if they if they fall by fall away from it they may come back to a, a, an older age and think well actually that experience for me was amazing maybe i should go and ride a bike again so thinking about people's different circumstances different barriers and being able to capture people at the right time and um, to be able to give them that opportunity 
um, that they might not, you know, otherwise get. Yeah, and like I say, giving it a go, it's a life skill, basically, isn't it? Once you've done it, you know that you can do it, and whether that means that you're going to continue to be a mad, passionate, keen cyclist for the rest of your life or not, it doesn't really matter because you know that you can do it if you ever need to. And I'm sure that lots of that, you find some of that is quite transferable into Absolutely. trying other things in life. Have you seen yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah, and I've, that, that's, that's one of my, you know, one of the things I love to stress is that if you can go out and, you know, go out on a mountain bike and you can challenge yourself um, on a ride, think about that, that's, you know, think about the risks you've taken and, and how you've pushed yourself out your comfort zone and how that can prepare you in, into your, you know, and how that can be transferable into your everyday life in terms of taking risks generally and helping you build your confidence and your own personal leadership, you know, to, to be able to develop. So, I, I, you know, that's why my, my two careers around diversity and inclusion and mountain biking and leadership, they both go very well together because it means, you know, mountain biking is, a, is about empowerment as well. Like riding bikes is about empowerment. <laughs> you know, it, it 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 creates this new lease of life for us, and it did that for me. You know, I never had a bike, and and then once I got to 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 realise what its capabilities were, where it enabled to me to do lots of things in life that I wouldn't have done before. Yeah, and then you realise what your capabilities are, which <laughs> seem pretty endless. Okay, right. So we're gonna what we're gonna do now is invite Shona Morris onto the screen. So she's also um, a project organizer. So Anila, why don't you just enjoy yourself a cup of tea, enjoy speak, uh, listening to the other speakers, and then we'll bring you back onto yeah. the group screen towards the end. So thanks Thank for you. that. And if we have so Shona Morris join us now. Hello. Hi Anna, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks for being here. And you're also a bit of a project guru you, you, that's really your role so why don't you tell people a little bit about you and what you do sure yeah so i'm a program manager for some of the projects we uh, we run here through cycling uk up in scotland and um, the the big main one which is actually run in england as well um, is the big bike revival um one of the other ones um is the, the bosses. We've got a few um, walking and cycling bosses run by Cycling UK, um, one in Inverclyde and one over in Argyll, um, which are, are aimed at um, creating or filling the gaps for walking and cycling in, in this particular areas. Um, and we also run um, female specific um, projects as well, the main ones, um, Bells on Bikes. We have a whole suite of other projects that run across Scotland, um, all tackling things like inclusivity and access to bikes. So that's my role here. It's pretty full on and pretty varied, I imagine, as well. Um, coming up. So where where do you come up with your project ideas from? How do you decide which sectors of society will really need a bit of a cycling love? Well, we we only work where there is an outlined need for it, and that is through the, the work that we're currently doing will identify that need. So, um, we have development officers um, and senior senior development officers based all over Scotland. Um, they work with community organisations, um, identifying what groups need support um, and what that support actually is, and how we can tailor um, our offer to them. And when there's something you know, a gap of really missing our opportunity that we feel is our job to, to come in and, and really support and, and lead on. That's when we'll, we'll put our heads together and speak to people from that area, from other organisations who are maybe doing things, want support doing some more things, and, and we'll, um, we'll just build the project from there, basically. And thinking about it from the women's cycling point of view, are there any projects that you're particularly proud of? Or passionate about that you've seen has had a huge impact, a positive impact on getting women into cycling. Yeah, I'm hugely proud of all the projects up here, um, and the, the staff that lead them are so passionate. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the biggest advocate for the, the, the women cycling in Scotland as well. But, but all the projects. Um, so we run the bells on bikes. We, when I say we run them, we we provide the opportunity for individuals in a voluntary capacity. Um, to run their own bells on bikes groups. These groups are not um, particularly 
focused on a certain discipline of cycling. They're, they're just entry level cycling, encouraging everyone or all, all um, anyone with any bike basically to come along and, and start cycling in a social environment. Um, we have supported, I think up to date, we've supported eight or nine groups across Scotland and they vary because they're voluntary led, they vary in um, activity. Some groups over summer will run, you know, two or three rides a week, which is, is massive when you're doing that voluntary. Um, and others will do a bit less, maybe once a month, but just to really keep the network there. Um, we have a development officer, Julie, who's really great at keeping all that going and keeping the network active. Um, so the group leaders um, and other volunteers in the groups can, can discuss things, discuss issues. And sometimes the different Bells groups from around Scotland will meet up and, and do um, rides together, which is, is lovely. Um, so that I think that's a, from the women's um, cycling point of view, that's something that we're, we're really proud of and, and we need more of it. So if anyone out there is thinking that they want to do something like this themselves, they need a wee bit of handholding maybe to set it up. And we can certainly offer that support and that comes in the form of maybe um, getting some first aid training for volunteers or some cycle ride leader training and um, even just information on how to how to do route planning and, and things like that. So if anybody's listening to this and you put the light bulb above their head and they're thinking they want to get in touch, could you, uh, sh should they get in touch with you or where's the best place for them to be able to get in touch and find out more about what you can offer in terms of that handholding? Yeah, so we've got loads of information on the Cycling UK website. So you can either go on the Cycling UK website and look at all the projects in Scotland to see what's happening around about you. Or um, there, there's a map on there as well for, for different projects. So I would say just have a wee look around the, the Cycling UK website. Um, you'll find different projects um, that might give you some more ideas or um, our contacts for your regional development officers on there as well. Cool. And how's lockdown affected things? Well, um, I think everyone knows there is a massive increase in cycling. If you go to a bike shop and try and buy a bike, you'll probably have quite a wait. Um, certainly local to me, I've seen a lot more people out cycling, but a lot more women on all types of bikes, which was great. And sometimes I thought, mm, that, that's a bit risky. That needs a be safety check, that bike. Um, but luckily, through the, the Big Bike Revival scheme that we did, we, we revamped it this year um, to respond to, to the COVID um, lockdown restrictions and um, working with more bike shops and more community organisations to provide support, free support um, to key workers so that people could cycle to and from work. And actually, 65% of the, of the people that we engaged with through that, that have responded to, to surveys so far, were female. Um, which we think was quite good. And some of the, so the bothies that I spoke about earlier, um, and, and the bodies we have um, bikes and e-bikes and all sorts of um, tandems and things like that and they've been the uptake um, for those bikes during lockdown for, for essential workers to get to and from work um, was 70% of females up, took that offer up so we're, we're seeing an increase in, in females specific yeah and do you think being in Scotland offers either unique advantages or challenges than other parts in the UK? I don't know, maybe the terrain might be different or culturally there might be things that are slightly different that are worth mentioning. Absolutely. The terrain, um, most of Scotland is, is really hilly. Um, hence the e-bike um, offers and uptakes have been really, really popular. Um, so that I'd say that was definitely a, a key challenge. The weather is obviously in, in Scotland, um, you know, Worse, more <laughs> seasons uh, in one day. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the offers through the, the projects that we run it can include things like accessories. So um, not just the bike or the e-bike, but um, some raincoats and waterproof bags that are actually appropriate for the bikes and things like that. Um, so we, we've tried to tackle um, some of the barriers through, um, through the projects that we're currently running. There's other barriers out there obviously um lockdown at the start anyway the, the roads were a lot quieter and that that's um kind of going back to the way it, it normally was the roads are a lot busier now and um, so i think a huge challenge going forward will actually be keeping people cycling when, when the roads are busier and um, so 
yeah, we've, we've got through that stage of getting more people on the bikes and letting them test out different bikes so they maybe want to come buy their own or continue to loan the bikes from us. That's great. But now we need to work with um, local councils and really try and advocate for, for safe, um, safe space and improved cycle routes as well. I think that would help massively in Scotland. It does, yeah, and I think down in England as well, it seems to have seen a lot of this uh, followed similar patterns that when there was no traffic on the roads, people seem very keen to take to their bikes. And I know that a lot of keen cyclists are not put off by traffic at all. It's, you know, they, they learn how to deal with it. Um, and that's just a step that doesn't really bother them. But I think somehow there's a little bit of ev evidence to go to show now that traffic is a barrier it is a big barrier and until we start to maybe address some of the transport and the way that we use the roads we're maybe not going to see such a surge in cycling unless we tackle the roads first what do you think on that yeah that's absolutely it and and you know that both both governments in england and scotland and, and wales i think as well um have, have committed a wee bit more money to um to do that um but I think we need we need to to act off the back of the the, the move we've had um, during lockdown, and make sure that we're we're catching it quickly and we don't let the uh, momentum of everyone cycling really um, diminish. You know we need yeah. to catch it if it's still um, hot. So yeah. All right, which is what we're doing. Striking whilst the yeah. iron's hot. <laughs> Let's do yeah. this. Okay, Shana, we well, thank you so much for that background and information. Yeah. Lot of food for thought there. And um, we're going to move on to another Shona. You can tell we're doing this in Scotland. <laughs> um, and so we've got Shona Black joining us on the panel now. Um, so just um, put your screen on and we'll see you very shortly. And don't forget everyone who's watching, I can see a few questions coming in um, about organised rides and um, how to encourage teenagers and all that sort of thing so perfect sort of questions to our um to our panelists to the topic that we're talking about today so please do keep them coming in and at the end we'll try and get them all answered um so any questions please do let us know shona thank you for joining us hello um, hello tell us a little bit about yourself and also you had to give you a little bit of time to switch the screen on for you there because it's not as easy for you as it is for other people. So do you want to explain a little bit about why and, and who you are in that, that sense? Yeah, I'm Shona, I'm, I'm visually impaired. I'm registered as blind and I have a guide dog as well. So um, that's why it was taking me a little bit of time to actually find the button on the screen <laughs> to, to put, switch the camera on, but it's on now. So yeah, so um, I cycle using a tandem um, and I have to, I, I, I'm on the back of the tandem, I have a front rider up the front, we call them pilots and stokers. So the pilot's the person at the front with all the controls and I'm on the back being a little powerhouse. So that's how that's how you managed to cycle. Did you, was there a point where you <laughs> thought that cycling wouldn't be for you? How did you discover that there were even options for you? Um I used to cycle a bit as a as a teenager and stuff. I didn't cycling wasn't really my sport. And then when I lost my sight I tried lots of other different sports skiing and all sorts of things but nothing really hit the spot until I got in I started cycling and then I got my own tandem I was so lucky I was given a tandem and uh, my, somebody from my, my local cycle club I just kind of got in touch and said do you think anybody would take me out <laughs> somebody volunteered which was fantastic so I joined my local cycle club and was going out with them and it just I just absolutely love it this sense of freedom I get when I'm out on a bike is just amazing that's amazing so, so you just took the initiative there to find out if anybody would ha be happy to pilot you and then you had a positive response were you at all nervous yeah. reaching out like that I mean that takes a lot of courage to put yourself out on the line like that I wasn't so nervous the, the poor guy that took me out had never been on a tandem before he was terrified <laughs> 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 I was he came off to me shaking. Uh, he got used to it quite quickly. But yeah, it's I I, I don't know. I, I was quite happy. I was didn't really find it too nerve wracking. And would you say that that's something that you just always had in your personality, like a confidence to go out and try new things, even if there's challenges in the way? Yeah, I think that's. I know a lot of people 
do find it very difficult and, and, and for a lot of people as well who are visually impaired or have a disability, you know, adjusting to that and getting used to that and having the confidence to go and do things is, is very difficult and they need some encouragement. So, but um, yeah, I think I'm <laughs> I like to try things. <laughs> it works out for you cool and I think as well you trying things also acts as an inspiration and puts you in a bit of a position of a role model for other people you know hopefully the people will see you or hear about your story and think well if she did it then I can do it do you feel a bit of a responsibility with that I think that has helped the tandem site then yeah I think there's quite a few people that well there's quite a few people I've brought along to site then who didn't think they could do it but they're and for pilots as well you know it's, it's a big responsibility for the pilots and a lot of them are really nervous so if I'm on the back and I'm sort of quite and I'm chilled out and relaxed about it it gives them confidence and it helps them to to feel happier about pushing us out. Yeah and are there initiatives you just sort of did it off your own back but in Scotland are there initiatives to help other visually impaired people um, to join schemes or to be able to experience what you've enjoyed experiencing? Yeah, well, we have the club in Edinburgh, we have the uh, Yellow, which was um, the so Cycling UK formed uh, some funding for I think Cyrus McDonald Trust gave us some of the funding, so we got tandems through them and uh, we, we built the club. There's another club over in Fife, Talking Tandems, um, and we were just before lockdown about <laughs> to start another one through in the West as well, but uh, that will take off once. Um, things have, have gone back to normal. It's really difficult at the moment because you can't socially distance on a tandem. So, you know, we are able to take advantage of it was breaking my heart and all this gorgeous weather and the roads were quiet at the beginning of lockdown and my poor bike stuck in the shed and I can't go out. <laughs> well, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, because uh, so many people are talking about, oh, the explosion of cycling in lockdown. Yeah. What a wonderful thing. But it just goes, sh serves as a reminder that not everybody in society and the cycling community are having the same experience. But I think yeah. you've got your, your static bike behind you. Is that something that you yeah. use much? Mm, she'd use it more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> It's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did dust it off and take it out at the beginning of lockdown and think, yes, I'll keep my fitness up, but it's not been used that much. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not always the same riding indoors and you have to do it for training. Yeah. Um, so what, what's the experience like? Yeah. Could you describe to people that maybe don't have a visual impairment what it feels like to be on the back of a tandem um, and somebody pedalling for you the sense, do you get a sense of freedom with it? What's just, yeah, descriptively, really? Yeah, uh, I'll usually wind on that one, pedaling for me. That doesn't happen. You would not let me away with that for a second. <laughs> the, uh, the, the person on the front has all the controls, they have the, the steering and the gears, etc. But the pedals are joined together um, with one big chain and you, you work as hard as the pilots. Um, you, you, it is, just amazing the sense of freedom you get you're out in the open air and sometimes the pilots you know say to me are you okay because I've gone quiet I'm just listening to the birds and things I, I love it I do quite often zone out a bit because I don't really have to concentrate on anything because the pilot does all the concentrating so I have to think about pedaling um also there's advantage of being on the back uh, that you can hide behind the pilot and you don't cut all the wind or all the bugs <laughs> which is good um, it, there has to be some great communication between the pilot and the stoker because they need to be telling you when you're coming up the bumps and when you're going to stop and when you're going to start and when you need to dig in for hills and things. So you, you have a good chats as well and you, there's always a bit of banter going on as well. It's, it's really good. So our pilots in the clubs, they don't really see themselves as people who are, you know, taking us for visually impaired people out or anything. They just see it as we're all friends going out for rides. Lovely. That is nice, yeah. I mean, and that's why people join yeah. cycling clubs to ride with other people. If yeah. if you just wanted to get your own experience, well, um, plenty of people do ride their bikes on their own. But when you don't want that, then why not think about tandeming? And actually, with that in mind, then are there schemes to help people become tandem pilots if they were in? If there's people listening to this that would be interested in having that as a role, or is it just something that people do kind yeah. of informally? Yeah, I think it's just 
Uh, no, we, we, with the club, we always need pilots. So if anybody feels like being a pilot, please get in touch. <laughs> we, we always need pilots. Um, that's one of the hardest bits, I think, for for any visual impaired uh, stalker, is getting people to, to, to pilot. And people sometimes will do it for a while and then they decide to, to go off and do other things or whatever. So it's quite hard keeping pilots, but we, well, we can't do it without them. But then there's, that's through the club. But there's a lot of informal things as well. You know, people just become friends and go out and bikes or family members go out with other people as well. So I've just had a comment here from someone called Esther. Thanks for commenting. And she said, I was excited to be auditioned to pilot a tandem to help a visually impaired rider, but I was just a tiny bit too small for the bike. I was gutted and left promising if I had a growth spurt at the age of 36, I'd get back in touch. <laughs> I think so, small. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Maybe you make that <laughs> Um, I just want yeah, there are different sizes. There are different sizes of tandem, so it may be that that tandem is too big. But we, you know, we have you know your smaller ones around. Cool. Hopefully, we can find a solution there because it's you know nice to hear that someone's enthusiastic to do it. So hopefully, mm -hmm. it's not the equipment that stops it from being able to happen. That should be the last of the barriers these days that we have. Um, and I just wanted to ask a little bit about um, because it's a women's festival of cycling your experience as a woman as a cyclist as well do you think it's made any difference uh, you're coming into this already with one big challenge um and the mm -hmm. second is you're in a sport that's dominated more by males has that had any impact either positively or negatively on you i can't really say it has to be honest uh yeah i think my barrier is more the, the, you know having a pilot the visual impairment um don't think it really being female does really pose any more barriers and um, for some people coming into it i think i have had a few people who uh, visually impaired females so, and, and because of the nature of vision impairment stuff they probably haven't been able to do much exercise so fitness is, is a worry and quite often weight can be a worry as well and that seems to be more of a worry to women than men um the body image and things so for that, for we were trying, we were starting a walking program with cycling like, say, to try and get the fitness up for people, and hopefully some people would um, come on to cycling from there once they've got confidence and and you know got a bit of fitness as well. But sadly, then we went into lockdown, so um, that will come at some point. But yeah, I think body image for some people can be an issue. Hmm. And I just um, want to jump back there. Actually, I was just been thinking about the. The actually accessing a tandem issue. If somebody would like to be a pilot, are there shared mm -hmm. schemes where I don't know, like there's a pool of tandem bikes or anything, or do you have to own your own? Own your own. But we have the tandems. Uh, our club has tandems. Talking tandems have tandems, um, and well, some stalkers will have their own bikes as well. There's also uh, an organisation called Charlotte's Tandems who lend bikes out to people. Don't I think the, the lend them out to disabled people to allow them to get out so that you know the, the disabled person could apply for for the bike and then the pilot could take them out on it. Brilliant. Thank you. Cool. Well, I think for the moment that's where we'll leave it. If anybody's got any more questions about that, please do put them in the chat because we're going to be coming to a group Q and A at the end. Um, and our final guest for today, so we're going to swap over now. We're going to invite Lilith onto the screen. Uh, so if you could switch your screen on, that'd be great. Nice and quick, very nice. Nice to see you there. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Good. Um, so you're setting a little bit of a new direction for this conversation because you don't fully identify as woman and you don't fully identify as cyclist either. So now we're doing a topic on uh, women cycling. So what in, in this sphere and what we're talking about, how would you identify yourself? Um, so I'm non-binary, um, which means I don't identify at all as a woman um, or as a man, um, uh, and I use they them pronouns, I prefer gender neutral pronouns. Um, yeah, and I I don't really call myself a cyclist either, um, I think mostly because uh, I'm not a leisure cyclist, I guess. Um, I do sometimes ride for the kind of joy of it, but I'm not a sports cyclist. Um, I cycle tour, uh, which means I travel with my bike and I commute and um, use my bike as a form of transport um, primarily. 
cool. I think that by default now you're just going to end up being in the camp of identified as cyclist because you've gone and written a book about it as well, uh, sharing a massive experience that you had, which by the sounds of it you almost did quite spontaneously without a huge amount of knowledge about the cycling world. So do you want to share a little bit about that experience? Yeah, so um, the book's called Gears for Queers and it's co-written um, with my wife, Abby. Um, we, uh, so I grew up in Cambridge, um, but I, we both live now in Kirkcaldy, which is in Fife. Um, and I kind of grew up cycling. Um, and when Abby and I met, we both wanted to travel. Um, so we kind of talked about walking and then I was like, well, why don't we try doing it on bikes? Um, so in 2016, um, just after I graduated from the AP University, um, we set off on our first kind of long distance cycle tour um, where we travelled from Amsterdam um, south through Europe to Montpellier in France. Um, and we really didn't have any experience of long distance riding. Um, the furthest Abbey had gone was kind of the commute into work, which is like 20 minutes. Um, so it really was a process of learning as we went. Um, and really kind of finding, or well, I guess finding our feet is the wrong phrase, but like finding our finding ourselves on two wheels um, and figuring out, figuring out um, what that felt like and what that looked like. And so what were some of your biggest learnings on that trip? Um, so I think we learned, we both learned different things, I think. Um, for me, I'd had really significant experience um, of mental health challenges when I was a teenager and uh, through into my 20s. Um, so the tour wasn't just about learning about being a cyclist and cycle touring, it was really about learning how to be in the world and how to um, exist in a way that kind of matched how my brain worked. Um, for Abby, it was really, um, you know, she had only cycled a really short distance, um, so she was really learning like what, what long distance riding felt like. Uh, we camped the whole way and neither of us had really ever camped before, so um, we had to learn like how to put up a tent. Um, you know, how to cook camp, camping food, how to read maps, we didn't take a GPS. Um, and we learned a lot as well, I think, about how the kind of riding we like doing, um, you know, how much we valued, like, the kind of infrastructure that was available to us as we headed through the Netherlands and Germany. Um, and yeah, I think that was it, was, it was all very, a very steep learning curve. <laughs> I bet Anila's in the background clapping away to this, hearing about how you're throwing yourselves into such a massive adventure. And, um, and like I spoke about with Anila, you, you often through riding, you learn things, you learn skills that are transferable into the rest of everyday life. I mean, you've mentioned map reading skills. That's surely got to be useful now. Um, but what about any of the other things, any of those learnings that, that are maybe not specifically about cycling, but because of cycling, you're able to use that in everyday life? It's maybe quite a hard one to think of on the spot. But I mean, I think Anila really hit the nail on the head when she talked about learning to take risks. Um, I think coming out of mental health services and um, having had that experience, and I think both of us um, being disabled and really learning how to live independently, there's quite a risk adverse, you kind of become quite risk adverse because you don't want to kind of muck things up, you don't want to muck up your mental health, you feel like you have to earn the right to make decisions about yourself. Um, and so being able to take risks and learn to trust our judgment of situations um, was a process that we went through together. Um, and I don't think it's something either of us could have done um, on our own. And, I, and I'm you know, profoundly grateful that we were able to share that kind of journey and that, that learning experience and come back and you know, I think it really did change um, how we were in the world and yeah, taught us about, about taking those risks and trusting ourselves and maybe trusting our bodies a bit as well to be able to cycle that distance and, and know, you know, know where our limits are, push them and respect them at the same time. Yeah, brilliant. And you also mentioned about uh, mental health earlier as well, because we recently did a panel about cycling and mental health. And it can sometimes be there's two sides of the coin. Often getting out on your bike is the best thing you can possibly do. And it clears your head and makes you feel like a new person. But it's not always the case. You know, sometimes you feel a pressure that you should be cycling or everybody else is out there doing it and things like that. So what does what cycling and mental health mean to you? Um. So it's interesting you mention it because um, certainly in lockdown, we found getting out on our bikes really hard. 
Um, and it's been great seeing everyone um, always like this increased kind of surge in cycling. Um, but the kind of additional anxiety of the current situation has just made planning and riding um, really challenging um, and put us really out of our comfort zone. Um, that said, like, I think kind of acknowledging that and talking about that is really important and still feeling like we can call ourselves cyclists and cycle tourists has kind of been important. Um, I think also kind of cycling and mental health, they cross over in so many ways, like even just thinking about the ways that um, when spaces are set up for cycling, they're also set up for like better mental health. You've got kind of less noise pollution. Um, you've got like greener spaces. You've got more sense of kind of ownership of the space um, and more kind of community and bumping into people. Um, just moving about. Um, obviously, there's this really clear link between like physical health and, and mental health and and cycling when it's done well, um, you know, when you've got a kind of options of like adapted bikes, when you've got good infrastructure, it's like a super accessible form of exercise um, and something that like, you know, for example, people who might struggle to walk long distances are, are able to cycle or, or trike long distances. Um, and I think also for me, like linking back to this idea of like taking risks and, and um, you know, cycling really gave me a sense of autonomy. Um, and kind of that empowerment um, and feeling like um, I could move under my own power, um, which was a really prof kind of profoundly positive experience uh, for me. Yeah, I think. And uh, I think also just um, there's lots of things you come up against um, with mental health challenges that maybe aren't or kind of disability that aren't talked about. So as an example, like I couldn't, I can't drive. Um, I'm not allowed to drive, which means that, you know, cycling, is is one of those key forms of transports that makes places accessible to me um and especially now when i'm trying to avoid public transport we've been told to avoid public transport um it's a really crucial tool in, in keeping me independent yeah it's basically fundamental it's really yeah. is yeah sort of bottom line and uh, you talked a little bit about um your sense of levels of independence and also about the strengthening of your relationship with abby what about the wider community what sort of people did you meet on your journey cycling did you um get connected in some sort of bike packing cycle touring community so i think there's kind of two channels to that i think there's firstly the people that we met on the tour and um on later tours that we've done um, and that's always kind of been lovely chatting to people at campsites who are also touring um, and connecting that way. And people who, who opened up their homes to us through things like warm showers, which is the cycle touring equivalent of couch surfing. Um, and those were all overwhelmingly positive experiences. Um, and I think also coming back from the tour and kind of starting to look at people on social media and connect to people through Instagram, connecting to people through the book um, and through the zine community. Um, and really seeing the kind of the diversity of people who cycle and who bike pack and and cycle tour and all the things they talk about and felt and kind of that welcoming and inclusive and joyful um and radical group of people like they bring me such joy just i know that kind of instagram can sometimes be a bit of a negative influence and i certainly have felt that need to measure myself up against cyclists that i see online but I also have had such like positive um, relationships and conversations and learned so much from that community um, that I think it's, it's kind of worth it. Yeah, and identifying with the queer society as well, has that either been a challenge or a barrier within cycling or has it, have you noticed any impact at all? Um, so I think probably the, in terms of cycling, I think first off, there's you know a lot of evidence and and stuff about um, kind of LGBTQ inclusion in sport and access to sport and why that's um, can, there can be barriers there, um, and you know I've certainly felt some of those. Um, but I think also kind of linking back to what some of the other panelists were saying, kind of feeling like you can go into a space and it's safe, and even that you can bring you can bring your whole self to a space because I think often um, as a well certainly speaking for myself as a queer person um, I think about what parts of myself am I bringing into a space can I talk about being non-binary in this space so is that going to cause me more hassle than it's worth um, and not just hassle you know for lots of 
people, especially especially trans women, there's a question of am I actually physically safe in this space to be out to to have those conversations. Um, so I think like I think that is a barrier, like just because maybe I think often cycling groups that aren't catering specifically to the LGBT community um, or cycling kind of organisations don't always ha have that thought about like how can I make it clear that this is a safe space for LGBTQ people how can I make it clear that the people can bring their whole selves and their wealth of experiences and kind of you know as Anita was saying all their identities um into that space and be welcomed and feel and feel safe and feel like they belong um I think that sense of belonging in cycling um can sometimes be hard to summon as a as a queer person yeah and so what I'm sort of picking up through all the speakers today, actually, is that um, once people seem to be into cycling, it's quite inclusive and people are welcomed. But taking those first steps is quite important to highlight and target and really aim at specific niche groups of people and their different identities or different challenges and different barriers. And like you're saying, make it visible and aware that this is also a safe space for and then, you know, literally write out what those, who those safe spaces are for, especially where it's communities of people that haven't normally in, been in the mainstream to have that, that safe space previously. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, cycling culture, we can all do better. Um, and I think we're, you know, one of the reasons why I value that community on, on social media, it kind of writing and blogs is that, you know, people are there telling us what they need to feel included, to feel like they belong, what they need to see. Um, and I'm always, I think we should be, you know, profoundly grateful when people are doing the work to tell us what they need. And, and I think now we have this responsibility to respond to that, you know, with better representation, um, with kind of inclusive language, with thinking about how we structure events, with where kind of money and resources go, where cycling infrastructure goes, all of those things, um, I think we can kind of continue doing um, and really, yeah, hold on to the kind of momentum and, and elevate the voices of people who are kind of asking for change and, and wanting to see change. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. Really insightful. And if you can just stay on the screen there and we'll start welcoming everybody else back onto the group panel and we're all going to have a chat together. We've got just under 10 minutes left. So we're going to go through to some questions from the audience and also amongst ourselves. If you, you know, if you're really inspired by somebody else's talk or you feel like you've got a question from someone else, would you pop your hand up? Well, I'm not very good at this. Um, this angle here but put your hand up if even within ourselves you've got a question that you'd like to ask to somebody else um so we'll just give it a second or two to welcome shona black back on um and also so this is out for the audience please do get your questions in you can put them in the chat bar and they're being fed through to us um we've got some especially about the tandem cycling so hopefully shona black will be able to uh, get back on the screen with us very very shortly but here um anila there was one for you um great trainer great you could join us um anila so someone says molly says i'm running a bike maintenance project in a secondary school and would love to engage girls in a girl only club do you have any advice on how to engage teenage girls in bike maintenance yes and uh, yes well some schools i know have you know bike um uh can do bike repairs bike maintenance because they've got their own workshops i work with a specific school in uh, which is gala shields academy and uh, they have a, a, a girls only club club which is fantastic because you know it gives again it gives them that safe space to be, be to be able to excel but i think one of the things that, that i've very much done is um i have run a leadership program specifically for young girls and so, yes, it's about getting out into the outdoors, experiencing, you know, that adventure. But at the same time, you really need to think about, up, you know, upskilling them and making them self-sufficient. So bike maintenance and bike, bike maintenance should be part of that. It should, you know, that whole experience and giving them the skills to be able to do that initially. So, you know, even just having a, a session with kids that make it fun, interactive, make it competitive. You know how how quick can you uh, um, you know fix a puncture? 
you know we've had we've had competitions in that um, and it's been it's really funny to see you may have five of them trying to figure out what to do not telling them what to do and then you know using that competitive element to actually get them to 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 do to do something and learn from themselves um so that's been great uh, great that's very much you know embedded into into the work we do so that they have those skills to be able to look after themselves and be independent so if you are doing any um you know if there are any clubs out there i would strongly recommend that you make bike maintenance specifically part of it but make it fun and um, and you know give them make them make them do it themselves and get them to learn because if once they do it's it's incredible that then they can go out there and be able to to look after themselves yeah learning by doing definitely the way forward um and a question here um i'm going to aim it at shona black first and then shona morris will also like an answer from you if that's okay so are there any clubs specifically for disabled i can still ride a two-wheeler but due to having Parkinson's disease, I'm much slower, and now I'm having to transition to an e-bike, which I personally think is a great solution, so I've done there. Um, but I now feel too self-conscious to go with other club members in fear of holding people up. As an aside, I used to pilot with um, Talking Tandems many years ago. Shona is so inspirational. Well, aye aye to that. Definitely second that. But so about the specific question, um, clubs for disabled, do you know any? Shona Black first. Not specifically, no. Um, I mean, we do have, we've got the ABC where people can come along, but uh, I don't know if you're talking about clubs where you can go out on longer rides and things. I mean, in the ABC, we will be, at some point, we'll be doing longer rides and doing lead rides and things. But at the moment, we're, we're not able to do things because of lockdown, etc. Um, but going forward, in the future, yeah, we will with ABC. We will be doing lead rides there as well. Okay, and where could somebody find out about that? Um, on the the um, Cycling UK website or on Facebook page as well. It's ABC. Okay, cool. Maybe to try and send out some information after this, possibly. Um, and Shona Morris, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, uh, there are a few more places. It's not um, so the the bosses um, also have adapted bikes um, of, of a few different ranges, e bikes and um, some um, trikes and things like that, and low step through. So they cater for people of different abilities, and um, you can find out about them on the website as well. There's also, if it is racing specific, there's a club um, based in Loch Winnip. They're called Race Sixty Three, and they've got a a number of, of racing um, adaptive bikes, hand cycles and things like that. I'm not sure what their full fleet is like, but it'd be worth um, checking them out on their Facebook page. Um, and they're more competitive as well, if, you, if you're still um, wanting to go down that route. And we also have um, developments soon um, up in Inverness way. Um, we've got a, a full fleet of, of um, e-bikes, uh, not e-bikes, sorry, adaptive bikes. Some of them are e-bikes, I think. Um, and again, you can find out about that. So I guess it depends where he's based in Scotland to, to where he maybe wants to access. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Great, thanks for that. And another one for Shona Black. If there was one thing you'd want a pilot or potential pilot to know, what would that thing be? Keep talking to the, your stalker. Um, communication is key and have fun so that's two things <laughs> <laughs> um, great another question for you Lily. um do you feel that women only cycling spaces clubs are inherently exclusive uh what you said about safe spaces for all really resonated with me and about making sure our language is inclusive from the start i ride with a women's group and we welcome absolutely everyone who likes bike and cake but are we possibly unintentionally putting up a barrier I think um, there's lots of reasons why you want might want a women only space. Um, and I think if you do, um, I think crucial to that is making clear that it's inclusive to trans women. Um, so all women are welcome. Um, I think if you're thinking about um, ways to um, include a wider range of people or specifically to think about ways to include people who maybe don't fit into kind of the traditional like cis kind of hetero male cycling culture um thinking about ways that you can talk about who you're who you're prioritizing or who you're centering in the club 
um, might be a, a useful step. Um, there's a, a bunch of um, kind of groups of riders in the US who um, call themselves WTF um, groups, and they're women trans femme groups. Um, and what they're essentially saying is that we're open to people who kind of sit outside of that, that experience of being kind of like cis men, but we're not exclusively kind of women only. We're also open to trans folks, so non-binary people, um, and we're also open to kind of femme, trans femme people as well. Um, so I think that's like, that's one option if you're thinking about like ways that you can use language to be more expansive um, and thinking about how you can explain who you're kind of centering or prioritizing in your group or in your rights. Brilliantly, brilliantly well said and a great question as well. Um, and I think that's it. Look, it's four o'clock, so we're just going to wrap it up right now. Um, is there anything else? Or actually, yeah, why don't we just go over by sort of one more minute? Is there anything else that you feel that you would like to add to this discussion today? You know, maybe it's an anecdote, something personal to you that's happened or something that you feel that hasn't been covered. Um, so who would like to go first with their with their closing a closing line, a closing words of wisdom. Anything like to say? Sorry, again, I'm putting you on the spot. It's it's not fair, but <laughs> you've all you've all had amazing insights. So it'd be great to hear from you. Let's just go maybe round the order that we introduced on the screen from. So Anila, any words of wisdom for you before we go? From you before we go. Yes, um, I would say one of my my words of wisdom would be never say sorry on the trail. I've heard so many women say, oh, sorry, you know, because they've, they've done something wrong or, or they think they've not conquered something on a trail, but please don't say sorry. You know, you, everybody's amazing and we should all be proud of ourselves being out there doing it, you know, riding technical trails, riding trails um, on our bikes, and we should be proud of that. So if you are with a bunch of women and somebody says, sorry, uh, for being slow or for being in the way or whatever it is, tell them not to say it. So yeah. never say sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no apologising. Great. Uh, Shona Morris. Um, yeah, just just to, to give it a go, get out there and you'll be amazed at how amazing you feel um, after whatever it is, if it's trying a new discipline of cycling or just getting the bike out of the shed and taking those first um, steps or, or pedals, um, just give it a go. Great. Uh, Shina Black? I'd be the same. Anybody who thinks that the, the, they're worried about going out in a tandem, whether it's the pile or the stoker, they think for whatever reason they can't just give it a go if you don't like it. You know, come along, have a wee tile session. Uh, you might just love it. You never know. <laughs> Great, very motivational. And Lilith, finally. Um, I guess I'd say um, don't don't see what you need in order to cycle as being a problem. Um, you, you know, I I found it um really empowering recently to get involved with more kind of cycle campaigning. Um, to advocate for the things that I need in order to cycle happily and safely. Um, and so I think, yeah, um, it's okay to demand the things you need in order to feel safe, whether that's a cycle path near you or whether that's a bike that you feel comfortable riding. Excellent, thank you. Cool, we've gone over time a little bit, but it's great to hear those final words of wisdom. Appreciate that, even though I did put you on the spot a little bit. Appreciate all your time this afternoon and also the attendees. Thank you for your questions. Really hope you enjoyed it. And I'm pretty sure that you definitely got something out of it. So until next time, see you later. Bye. Bye.